care about anything like it's everything. Trading is a shit ton of little details and little things that you must do to be successful. Today is Thursday, June 27, 2024, and this is the week and charts. I just want to thank all you guys and girls for attending. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. We'll be done long before the debate, so don't worry about that. I'll make sure that I'd like to watch that myself. All right, what are we going to talk about? Well, current market conditions, obviously. Your questions on trading, feel free to punch them in. Um, I am monitoring a couple screens here, or actually a couple of uh, windows. So if you're on YouTube, uh, be patient. It might take me a second to get to you. And there's also a bit of a, of a lag. Uh, on YouTube. This is a live and go to webinar, but it's a simulcast to YouTube. So your favorite stock and crypto picks, wait till we get to the live charts for that, which will be in a few minutes. And just punch them in one ticker at a time so I know what I covered and what I didn't. Now, I wanted to cover a lot of the methodology in action. And, and this week uh, I got to think about it. Well, it's actually kind of like IPO fever. And I was thinking in how to catch it. So I'm going to show you a couple of patterns that I use with IPOs. And some uh, one, both of these were mentioned in my Facebook group, and then one of them was a setup in my service. So what I try to do is anything I show you, I want to make sure that I mentioned publicly before I got in personally. Rebooting the Landry 100, that'll make sense in one minute. I'll explain that in one second. In a million little things part three, I have so much other stuff I want to talk about. I only have a few things I want to cover, but I do there's one thing that I think is crucial this week. So we'll continue that series and then we'll pick it up again next week. QA, feel free to ask questions as we go. There's a flame screen, as you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often sum it up, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Boy, do I know that, huh? There's all my contact information if you want to do a screenshot of that this is recorded and recording a live and edited version will be available on youtube right after and then tomorrow i'll put up an edited version of everything all right let's talk about the mystery charts and the methodology in action no mystery charts this week i haven't seen a whole lot of meaningful setups lately that's okay that's a database saying hold on let the market shake out a little bit and as soon as we get some setups i'll start showing setups again with the uh, as a mystery chart now this was a buy at b we did talk about this one in facebook the buy at b pattern is you have to wait at least to the close of the fifth trading day and buy a new closing high that's pretty much it except for a couple of minor rules one ideally you want the stock to be less than i call it the 20 dollars rule but it's now the 30 dollars rule stock needs to be less than 30 dollars a share and two, there's a day one rule, which I'll show you right now. If the high for the week is set on day one, then it not only has to close at a new closing high, it also has to close above that high. So you can see a new closing high would have been right here on May 28th. That would have been a normal buy at B. So if this high here was a little lower, it would have been a buy at B. And then in this particular case, the buy B was right there. So again, closing high for a normal signal without the day one rule, if this high was lower than this high or this high was higher than that high, however you want to look at it, then the closing high is your trigger. Now, there's a few other caveats, like you want to make sure you've got plenty of range and adequate volume. And in some cases, if it makes a really, really extreme move, it's a little little harder to get in uh, as far as it's a little more dangerous to get in. But anyway, so I ended up buying market on close here. And in this particular account, I did a thousand shares. I did do it on another account too. And the next day I was able to flip out half for a two point gain. So that's that's much better than a poke in the eye. So two points, obviously times half the shares, 500 shares. That's a thousand dollar trade. John, did you take this one? I don't know if John John was just here a second ago. Um, did you take this the the buy it B and N and E? John is our resident expert on IPOs in our Facebook group. Anyway, I, I got out at a little bit of a loss on the remaining shares. And what I was doing there was applying a little discretion. I'll show you another case where I applied discretion 
and it didn't really work fantastic either. But longer term, if you're able to occasionally stay with a big winner through a little bit of discretion, not throwing caution to the wind, uh, then you'll do quite well longer term, that is. But shorter term, eh, sometimes not so much. Now, ideally, you don't want to let your position turn into a losing trade on the second loaf. So to make, But at the least, you want to make sure you make money overall. Sometimes I'll let that second loaf back up a little bit into the negative column if the stock may have gotten a little a little bit uh, further away from itself or ran a little too far too fast. Like this case, it kind of blasted higher. So I expected a bit of a retrace. Unfortunately, use a little discretion didn't work. But overall, $655, and this was in just one account. So you could pick up a little money on occasion with these buy these. And every now and then a stock just keeps on keeping on. And that's what makes it all worthwhile. Now, a few days later, it set up as a trend pivot pullback that's a tpp down here and the entry was here the stop was down here and the initial profit target was up here and here's how i played it so i bought it when it began to break out above that high when it triggered an entry there's the trades down there if you want to screenshot it i don't know why it just filled 100 at a time i guess because it's slightly thin so I went with 700 shares. The service called for 677. This is my model account, or at least that's what I call it, where I work to mimic the trades as close to the service as possible, but I do apply a little bit of discretion. So in this particular case, it was fairly close to the profit target. So I went ahead and exited. Again, that's a little bit of discretion. Two days into the trade, or two and a half days into the trade, whatever the case may be, and you're pretty close to that initial profit target. Remember, the real money is in the second loaf. So you can see I was a little shy of the IPT, which would have put $1,000 into my account. And I made $822. But I still have a, a chip in a chair, so to speak, the potential for a big winner. And then I ended up getting stopped out here. So we add all that up. It turned out to a $3,200 trade. And if you add it all up, the first loaf and the second loaf, it comes to 4711. And that's in about a week's time. So that's much, much better than a poke in the eye. Now, the service followed mechanically would have made about $5,000 just doing everything on a mechanical basis. Now, again, I did apply a little discretion in attempt to squeeze out some additional profits. Now, you'll notice at the high, this thing was 37.50, and we gave it a tremendous amount of room, which was turned out to be a bit of a bummer. But the idea was, in case this thing went super parabolic, to really catch a, a, a big piece and, and have it take off. You've hidden your webcams, but you're still sharing. Okay. So anyway, that was at the high. Now, I know it's a little fuzzy logic, but at the high, that half a position was worth 10,000, over $10,000 in profit. And the question is, so why did I give up so much? Well, I'm, I'm asking myself that repeatedly <laughs> when I go to sleep and when I wake up, right? Or at least uh, when I go to sleep tonight because I stopped out today. Well, the real money is in the longer term trends. Unfortunately, sometimes they get ahead of themselves like this. Now, if this stock would have had options, I probably would have been more tempted to possibly take some partial profits and fritter away a little bit of those profits on options. So let's say you flip out 100 shares and that's about, what's that, $2,500? Maybe keep $2,000, put that in your account and then fritter away $500 on some crazy out of the money options. And I know it's, it's like you're just pissing that money away. But you know when a stock is up 16 points in one day, especially if it's a $15 stock the day before and it doubles overnight, you know it's going to have some retrace to it. But like Bill Dunn said, and before Bill Dunn, I think it was Stanley Kroll in the, what's the name of that book? Professional Commodity Trader or something. It's got a few little tidbits in it if you want to read it. It's an older book. You'll have to search for it to find it. If, if it had options on it, you would have had some options to, to do these kind of kind of crazy things. And I know those who are probably more into options 
or, or more um, knowledgeable options than me. Like for my, for me with options now, occasionally like today I did a spread on something, but nine out of 10 times, I'll just buy outright options. And, and I don't believe in getting too complex because you end up with too many moving parts too quickly. But in a case like this, when you're up super big, it wouldn't hurt to take a little bit more, a little bit off, okay? And Linda Rasky says, uh, feed the ducks while they're quacking. How did this stock make it to your radar screen from Brian? That, that's a good question. Every day I run a scan that produces 1,500 to 2,000 stocks and I flip through them very quickly. I also, about 20 minutes before the close, and I'll give you my scans if you want them, but about 15 minutes or so before the close, I look at all the IPOs sorted by volume and I maintain my database of IPOs. There's a couple little tricks you could use to maintain that database that I can discuss at some point in time if you like or we could pick it up in the comments below later after the recording is done uh, tomorrow maybe but there's a few tricks you could use you could also certain platforms and thanks to a little nudging from me stock charts was kind enough to add ipos to their database to where you could see the ipos you could use finviz also and i can help you guys uh, get set up with any of this if you want but i also look at the look at the ipos so that's how i found it I find a lot of my IPOs, sometimes a lazy way, through my Facebook group. And like I said earlier, John Ross, who's here tonight, is very kind. He often shares his IPO analysis with us, which which I'm very grateful for. In case I get super busy, I've got a lot of positions on and I'm watching the screen, I forget to do my IPO analysis. That's one of those million little things we talked about last week, or, or last show, I should say. I'll look on Facebook to see if there's any action going on there anything that I might have missed. So that's how I got to the radar screen. IPOs can be a little tricky because sometimes your your charting package doesn't cover all the IPOs and, and I'm guilty as anyone of not checking up on this. But if I look at FinViz and stock charts and Telechart, between the three of those, I've got all bases covered. And I also, again, pay attention to what John's doing, see if I can pick up anything from him. So getting back to this, why did I give up so much? Ideally, I don't. I didn't want to do that, but I was kind of playing a game where like, I'm going to follow the service as mechanically as possible just to see what happens, just in case this thing takes off. And I gave it plenty of breathing room. Unfortunately, it, it took out the stop. And again, you know, hypothetically speaking, and what would the world be without hypothetical questions, said Mr. Wright. If it would have had options, I'd be willing to bet, I can almost bet you with absolute certainty that I would have cashed out of some shares, especially in accounts where I had bigger positions in this. And I would have frittered away a little bit of those profits on some options. And that could be a really cool thing if it if it just absolutely melts up. Now, of course, it doesn't always work. But when this thing was up big, I started thinking to myself, hmm, I bet I'm going to get emails from people that tell me they, they can't make money with the service, but they didn't take NNE. And this is a reoccurring theme. And believe me, I don't always make money with the service, okay? But over time, it tends to do okay. I've had a few clients who've been with me for more than 10 years, and they're very happy. It doesn't make money all the time. Somebody a while back emailed me and said, um, I'm not making any money with this thing. And I, I was like, well, I'm thinking, okay, well, first of all, you've got to give it six months at least, you know, but let me just take a look at things. And so I looked at it and I'm like, you know, you should have made a little money. We, we're doing okay now to look at it. I knew we had a couple of winners. I just didn't know whether or not he had joined before the winners showed up. And this is a reoccurring theme. So I'm not picking on anyone in particular in case this sounds familiar. <laughs> because it is familiar with more than one person. And it's like, it was two or three of them he didn't get, but he got the other stinkers. It's like, well, that's why you can't make money. And it's because trend following is an outlier game. And, and as I've said a thousand times before, I was told, don't make it sound so elusive. Well, it is, okay? And it can be elusive, but every now and then you knock it out of the park. Now, just to sidetrack for a second, it's a lot of fun being in a stock and watch it go up a couple hundred percent. But ideally, I'd much rather be in a stock, and I think I said this a second ago, that just kind of gradually goes up over time, and I'm able to ride that stock out 
for a year and sometimes occasionally a little longer. But anyway, as soon as I got to thinking about, geez, I wonder who took this setup and who, who didn't bother taking it for whatever reason, and the, my email dings literally as I was thinking about it. And, and look, I'm not going to pour, I'm not pouring salt in, 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 in the wounds here, okay? But it is a very teachable moment and it does kind of dovetail nicely into the million little things thing. So I want to make sure I cover this, but believe me, I'm not pouring salt in anyone's wounds. I get beat up a lot in the markets. I know how it feels and you don't want to <laughs> add insult to injury. But again, it's a teachable moment. It's one of these million little things. And this gentleman said that he didn't take in an E because he wrote the wrong symbol down. Well, that's a that's a new one for me. And that's why I'm always saying there must be 50 ways to lose your money. And I'm going to come back to this in a second and talk about how important the details are as a trader. And it's 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 borderline brutal. And as I'm going live tonight, I'm thinking like, geez, Dave, you're going to make it sound too tough. And it's like, well, it can be tough at times. And you really have to be on your game. Now, the secret to trading, and I think Livermore said this, is, is not making the same mistake twice. And somebody once said that a mistake made twice is a choice. After my first daughter was born, I was kind of frazzled and everything. And I, I went to the ATM to get some cash out. And I left my card in the ATM. And when I got back to the hospital, my wife said, well, you'll do that once. And evidently she had done that years ago. And that's the first and last time she did that. And now whenever something happens, I'll, I'm always telling her like, you'll do that once. So writing down the wrong symbol, that's like a, a you'll do that once thing. In trading, as you learn these painful lessons, and I'm trying to figure out a way to kind of write about this, but just to kind of tell you my, my my trend of thought here, my train of thought, uh, I say trend of thought because I'm working on a book called Trend of Thought, Random Thoughts from a Trend Falling Moron. But my my trend of thought is you it has to be painful enough so you won't do the same thing again, but not so painful that it cripples you, okay? And that's how trading lessons need to be. It's like, don't beat yourself up too bad, but do put some kind of commitment device in place. Now, I have another buy it B example for you, and I just checked with, with John right before we went live, and he said we did talk about this one in the Facebook group. So there's... I grabbed this trade out of one account. I did take it across multiple accounts. I don't know if I did more or less than other accounts, but I do still have an open position here. But you can see I bought 600 shares, flipped out 300 for a two-point profit. Now, the buy was right here on this particular one. Now, this was kind of an interesting situation because, as I kind of alluded to earlier, when you're trading the buy at B, okay, and the reason I call it buy at B is if a market's going to go from A to C and B is somewhere in between, it has to go through B. And that's kind of the premise of the Landry 100, which I'm going to talk about in just a few minutes. But anyway, the buy at B is you need to have a somewhat decent range. And then the range on this particular stock was made on, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. So technically, no, it wasn't. a. You had to close above this high. This was the highest close. And then also notice that since this day set the high for the week and not the first day, then the buy is any close above this. Now, had it closed just marginally above this level here, I probably wouldn't have taken it. But this stock began to widen out. It began to accelerate higher. So I figured it was worth a shot. And I took a relatively small position in it, but big enough to make a little money. And I flipped it out there, flipped it out the next day for two points. And so far, I'm still in the position. Now, you can see it came dangerously close to going negative, okay? But I figured it was worth a shot to hang on, although it did not go negative. Technically, if it went negative, I should exit. But knock on wood, so far, so good in this one, LIF. All right. Hey, if you're liking this video, then like it. 
If you don't like it, then go have no fun somewhere else. I'm half kidding. <laughs> Hello, Alex from Brazil. Good to have you. I have to learn how to speak Portuguese and come visit you guys. You guys are super kind to me. I appreciate what you do, especially on uh, YouTube and all. Years ago, I, I ran a portfolio, so to speak, and it was all hypothetical, but it was it was done in real time. And I had a hedge fund that that did show some interest in it, and momentum had slowed a little bit. And it's it's not the easiest way to trade, although I think it would be a, an interesting experiment, and, and it could be somewhat mechanical. And I think your execution. I think you could take a lot of the trading psychology out of it and just follow along. And anyway, it's 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 not a tremendous amount of work, but it is some work, okay? And then adding work on to IPOs and a little of the intraday stuff that I occasionally do, more than occasionally do, that I shouldn't be doing. Uh, the core methodology, my educational business, presentations, I'm going to overwhelm myself and go through it all. So it is one more thing to do, but it's a very worthwhile venture. And I'd encourage you to keep your own momentum list. You don't have to be as formal as I am with it. I guess the first question is, what is it? Well, it's 100 momentum stocks, okay? So hypothetically, a million-dollar portfolio, 100 slots, so to speak, and each stock, starting out at least, gets 10K allocated to it now how is it created there's no set rules but the stock must be making a new closing high on the day that it's added to the list now ideally you want a 52 week closing high but lower closing highs such as a 90 day high might sometime be considered especially when the market is a little lackluster and maybe Maybe like after a bear or a big correction, a bear trend or a big correction, you've got a lot of stocks that are coming off of their lows. And one, one way of thinking or one kind of an ancillary story with this is I've helped a few kids and uh, win stock selection contests just by telling them to buy new highs and only buy new highs. And they've done quite well with that. It does it. it it has its problems, and that's why it's over 100 stocks. I think it'll work quite well, but I, there is a lot of nuances that I'll get to here in just one second. And this is kind of an intro tonight. We could, we'll revisit it over time, and I'll show you what it's doing, uh, both good and bad. Uh, higher volatility stocks within reason are given precedent over lower volatility stocks. So I'm trying to keep that HV up a little bit, although every now and then there's a stock in the low 20s that looks pretty good that I think might be worth a shot. There's a, a bit of an anomaly that occasionally occurs with volatility. If you do have a stock that's persisting in its trend, the volatility will come way off. And that's when I might make an exception for a lower price stock. Now, the stocks must have adequate volume, ideally half a million shares or more. And I create a tradable universe and I sort them by new highs. And that's how I add to the list. Now, stocks with negative performance are called out first okay so if something's losing it gets kicked out although it's a good problem to have some sometimes your high flyers begin to implode a little bit and you have to kick them out too like the nne will be kicked out at the was kicked out i should say at the close of today now in a rip roaring bull market through relative strength you might have stronger stocks displace issues that are still positive. And that's where you just keep building and building and building and building, and you're getting the best of the best of the best of the best. Now, cash is treated as an asset class. When I first did this experiment, it was probably over 10 years ago. And by the way, back then I had better stock, uh, stock charts, not stock charts, uh, telecharts had a program, I think it was called Stock Finder or something, and it allowed me to go in and create this index and track this index. So if anybody knows of something out there that I could do this with, or maybe even through um, stock charts, and I'll approach stock charts and see if there's something that they want me to maintain for them and 
possibly do. And I think that would be, I don't even go to party with me, a lot of fun. <laughs> but uh, when I first did this 10 years, it might've been 15 years ago, I was gonna have a hundred stocks no matter what. And then I quickly realized when we went into a bit of a bear market or a choppy extended, extended choppy period that I couldn't find enough stocks. So then I began to treat slots as as asset classes so it'd be like a cash slot okay so it might we might only have 50 stocks when conditions aren't fantastic or or fewer but the ideally you want 100 and right now i'm able to find enough stocks to where i can keep 100 in the list and i've only started restarted this a few weeks ago now the premise is if a stock that goes up 100% or 1,000%, it, any stock that goes up 100% or 1,000% must make a new high first. Therefore, buying new highs guarantees that you're in for the ride, okay? So again, it's kind of like the buy it, be with the IPOs, right? If a stock is going to go to brand new highs and beyond, it's going to have to make new highs first. So let me rewind that. If a stock is to go to is to double or triple in value, it's gonna make new highs first. And that's the whole premise of technical analysis. But if you ever get caught up with a 4E transform or Elliott wave counting or Fibonacci or a lot of mumble jumble stuff out there, square of nine or whatever this crazy stuff is, take a step back and realize, hey, you know, markets that are in these great trends, I noticed that they make new highs before they make these new trends. So Start there before you get into all this complexity. But anyway, market has to make new highs before, before it goes up 100% or 1,000%, obviously. Now, can you just buy new highs? Is it really that easy? Well, not exactly, okay? And the reason is markets often fail when they're breaking out to new highs. So it is dangerous just to buy new highs. However, some will accelerate higher enough uh, enough to ride for a long, long time. So the point is, if you buy enough stocks that are making new highs, especially in a momentum market, you're guaranteed to catch some really big winners. Now, of course, sometimes I put a new stock in the portfolio. Like, what did I put in today? Uh, I haven't done it yet, but uh, KGC, okay? So KGC broke out the brand new highs today on a closing basis. So that was going to go in tonight. And I think CRDO, I'll have to double check that. Now, technically, I should have went in on the close, but again, this is all hypothetical, okay? But I am tracking it as close to possible as possible. But of course, for it's all for educational purposes and all those other disclaimers in hypothetical. But anyway, so if you look to the left, now I grabbed the screen a couple of days ago. But you can see the NNE made a new high and was up 224% in 19 trading days. Cores, C-O-R-Z, was up 88% in 19 days. Thank you, John. appreciate that. John just sent me the thread, I believe, that showed the LIF. So we'll take a look at that after the show. So that's the point, and and this just I just started this about a month ago, and you could see that there's some decent gains in here: eight, eight percent, twelve percent, eleven percent, eighteen percent, twenty something percent. Now again, we're just buying these new highs. So in the case of an IPO, especially a liquid IPO like this, I can put buy at bees into the Landry 100. Now when IPOs cool off a little bit which they've been cold for a while. They finally just kind of warmed up. Let's hope they stay that way for a while. But when IPOs cool off, maybe some other area might begin to, to warm up. And it really does a good job showing me where the money is flowing and it makes sure that all these stocks are on my radar. Now, here's the other thing too. Not every stock, even if it's a great momentum stock, will fit my methodology. So you might have a stock, and I don't know if NVIDIA is a good example, but NVIDIA might have gone up quite a bit, but didn't really set up perfectly for my methodology. It happens, okay? You will miss some. The good thing about this list is at least you're able to see where the momentum is, and maybe there's a stock similar to NVIDIA that's setting up. 
like AMSC right now could be set up really soon as an example. Now, again, on an individual level, it doesn't always work and nothing always works, okay? But this can work really well over time. And if you get into a momentum market, it'll absolutely print money. That I can guarantee. Unfortunately, I'll tell you this, momentum ends badly and you do will get whacked every now and then. And you can see like, here's an example of it not always working. I put this one on and then in 13 days, it's down 15% and it already got kicked out. So the buy was here and the next day it traded a little higher before it came right back in. It happens, right? But you've got a hundred of these, so you could survive a few of these. In fact, it's kind of interesting. The 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 ones that I took out that were losing was uh, down like thirty thousand dollars. I took thirty thousand dollars, so to speak, of losses in this portfolio, and I was looking at it a couple of days ago. Now, granted, things have changed since, but just the NNE trade, one out of one hundred of those stocks, because it went up three hundred percent was enough to cover all of the losses. And I was thinking today on the way back home from the gym that the secret to trading is figuring out how to cover your losses and then all you're left with is winners. And I know, easier said than done, but it's something to strive for, for sure. Anyway, uh, I often say it's always darkest right before it gets more dark. And that's when I'm teasing the people who wanna pick bottoms, but you can see we exited this for a 5% loss, or I exited for a 5% loss. Again, it's all hypothetical. And since it's been taken out, it's dropped another 18%. So momentum tends to be to get momentum, and that's both up and down. So what's the purpose? Purpose? <laughs> purpose? Uh, <laughs> what's the purpose? Well, proof of concept, okay? That things that go up tend to keep going up and things that go down tend to keep going down. Uh, and weakness, of course, begets more weakness. And keeping winners in and kicking out losers first, kick the losers out first, is the secret to successfully managing a stock portfolio or a fantasy football team or your business team, okay? As I often say, often and over and over and over and over and over again, if you had three employees and two were busting their ass and one was sitting on us, which employee would you fire? Well, you wouldn't fire the two good employees because they've been working so hard they, they're bound to get tired of working. And you wouldn't keep that that bum because you you were thinking, can you call somebody a bum now? <laughs> I don't know if you can call somebody a bum now, but I'm gonna call him a bum. You wouldn't keep that bum you would get rid of him, right? You wouldn't think, oh, you know, Joe over here is, uh, he's he hasn't done anything since he's been here the last three or four weeks, but he's bound to start working anytime. Well, you've never applied that logic in trading, but that's exactly what many people do. Brian says, and that's when the flashlight batteries usually run out. When's that? Uh, when you kind of lost me on that one. Now it does provide interesting insight. So I could say, I could say, okay, looks KGC is a gold stock, right? So it's like, well, gold is eh, it's kind of lackluster. <laughs> Not to no pun intended. Lately, but why is this stock beginning to take off? Who cares? Okay. But it does kind of make you look at things and say, all right, I'm seeing some semis, I'm seeing this. Oh, I just kicked out a semi or two. Wait a minute, are we getting some rotation happening? Their restaurants, ah, who wants to buy a restaurant? But there was a restaurant a couple of days ago or whenever that showed up. And so like, right, let's put it in the list, see what happens. So a lot of good comes from it. It gives you a feel for what themes are currently working. Semiconductors, AI, but again, sometimes a lot of things you would never think about, like commodity related areas like gold, of, of course, and then restaurants, and then I'm sure at some point it'll be utilities and it's like value will become momentum and momentum will become value. That's kind of a, a longer term cycle thing. And I think that this list will help to, to flesh that out and, and show you. Now, 
I don't have a way to track it at the moment other than in a spreadsheet, and I'm not tracking the day-by-day -day equity swings, but I have to tell you, back when I could track it, and again, I think I use StockFinder, if memory serves, to do this, this thing would get crushed, absolutely crushed, like down 2 3%, maybe even 5%, okay? I forget the exact numbers. It would get crushed. And it's like, I'd look at the market, the overall market was the you know, P's would be flat on the day. I'm like, what the hell's going on? And over the next several days, the P's would just get absolutely smashed. And that was a really cool thing. And I, I need to get this index working again as an overall index so I could track it on a daily basis. Because I think if you did that, you would have a heads up like, okay, stock market is still going up. Things are looking pretty good, but the time... The, the the bomb is ticking for the market to get whacked. And then knowing that information, don't be a hero, but knowing that information, maybe you can go in and catch the mother of all intraday moves, maybe in zero DTE options, uh, which could be really dangerous, believe me, I know, or something along those lines, play in a small way that could pay off really, really big. There was, um, I was looking at something the other day, and, and you got to be careful with these things, I know. But they were like three cents, and then they 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 shot up over a dollar when we had that huge rally in the last few minutes the other day. So that's kind of an interesting observation. It does get crushed a few days before the market tanks. So anyway, it's something nerdy, and I think it's a worthwhile exercise. And at the least, it's going to show me the Nvidia's the next Nvidia. Don't you hate when people say that the next Nvidia? You know, but it will show me that. Now, I just want to cover a couple things tonight, a million little things. We'll pick it up again next week. It was all the other stuff I wanted to cover. Get out of the way first. Now, years ago when I watched the show, the show, the movie, <laughs> Rudy, I noticed that when Notre Dame enters the field, they have a sign, trade like a champion today. And in my particular case, this is, well, this is right above my, my builder actually took this. You can see the ladder inside. My office this was right as my office was being finished. And my builder took this picture. But anyway, uh, he liked it a lot. He's a football guy. And the idea is to slap it on the way in the office, but it's about, it's a little bit out of my reach. So I might have to get a little step stool or stand on my bear's head. I got a little carved bear here. My wife uh, surprised me with that a while back, a while back, 20 years ago. <laughs> anyway, it's a, it's a silly little thing. But often I forget to trade like a champion. So number 391,255, trade like a champion. So what does that mean? Well, on each trade, just say, am I trading like a, a, a champion? Is this a planned trade? Okay. Is this a F yeah trade like we talked about a couple of shows ago? Okay. And if you're not feeling F yeah, then don't take it. And another thing, which I'm going to probably talk about next week, is when you go into a trade, if that trade ahead of time, okay, of course, you say, okay, if this trade fails miserably, I would not care. Yeah, I might drop an F-bomb, but I know that there's a very good high probability that this trade might work. I'm trying to think of one that was recently uh, like that, that I really felt that. LF LFMD, maybe, one of those, or it might have been uh, TARS, T it was TARS. And I was kind of shocked when it didn't work out at first. But if I'd have stopped out and it failed miserably, I would have said, you know what? I would take the same setup again tomorrow. And we'll get into that in detail next week. But ask yourself, am I trading like a champion? And if you've been doing this for a while, you know whether or not you're trading like a champion. And that's the hard part. And that's where that's where the ups and downs really come in because it's like you do stupid shit and you're like, why did I do that? Like, Paul, I know not to do these things but I do them anyway. Now at the end of each day, it's kind of like a kind of like an affirmation, okay? And then it's kind of like, am I doing what I affirmed? And then after that, do your post-mortem. And I'm guilty of not doing that post-mortem every day. And I really need to make sure I'm doing these things. And that's part of why a lot of the stuff I tell you is stuff that's reminding me to do these things, okay? Now, at the end of the day, you need to ask yourself, did I trade like a champion? Did I trade? I got to fix that post. Did I trade like a champion today? And I want you to notice that I didn't say, did you make money? Okay. 
You could trade like a champion and not make money. Shit happens, as I often say. But if you did what you were supposed to do, then you did the right thing. Linda Rasky talked about someone who was following a mechanical system. I forget his name. And at the end of every day, he would get his team together and say, how do we do following the system today? He didn't say, did we make money or did we not make money? He basically said, how do we do following the system? And a lot of professional traders who have helped out, who have had people like interns come in or whatever, if they make money and they did something stupid, they, they're they likely to lose their job as opposed to doing the right thing and losing money. And there's a lot of those little things in the turtle books, specifically the way of the turtle. I, I didn't re I think I don't think I've read Coble's books on that. I kind of felt like he was kind of taking from them, whereas I read Facebook. Well, that was based on a recommendation from Larry McMillan. But I read Facebook because, like, he was an actual turtle, okay? I know Face got his ups and downs, but anyway. But in there, they talk a lot about Dennis and how he treated people who did or did not follow the system. And in one case, uh, somebody didn't take a losing trade, and he was actually called in the office and asked why he didn't take the losing trade. And his argument was that, if he's three pages into his analysis, he's found that usually it's not nothing worth trading. And so he he quits at three pages and that was his excuse. And it was, I don't know if Dennis believed him or not, but he was able to keep his job. Anyway, let's say you got a tiny little tick off the lows and something that's in an obvious downtrend. You've got tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of downside Landry light. And you decide to buy it here because it's done going down. So you think, right? Well, you end up bailing out at the lows. You obviously did not trade like a champion. And again, it, it is obvious when you're doing the wrong thing. And I'm kind of beating myself up here because I've, I've done the wrong thing lately a few times. I get a little full of myself. I do the wrong thing. I adjust and then start over. And it's a constant process. And you, you've got to constantly strive to get better and better and better, which sort of dovetails into our next point. A few years back, my wife was watching a show called The Bear. And when I'd walk through the house, I would I found myself, like when I go in for lunch or whatever, I find myself sitting and watching and really enjoying it and one day as i'm walking out of the house to come back to work i told her i said i, I wouldn't mind watching that that looks pretty interesting and she said i'll watch it again with you and that's a good litmus test because if she'll finish anything or most anything i should say even if it's bad and that's there's, there's a psychology behind that we could discuss that at some point although in more recent years we do have a superpower we call time of death and so we're watching a really crappy movie and we're about 35 minutes in. It's like time of death, 35 minutes, 40 seconds. And then it's like a superpower. We've, we've started it and just quit a bunch of crappy movies from that. But anyway, long story endless, I did watch her with it. Uh, John says the bear's a good show. Yeah, it's really good. It's intense though. I've forgotten how intense it is. We're, we're rewatching it because the third season's coming out and we wanted to kind of catch up because it's been a few years. These things come out and then it take years to come out again. I don't know if COVID had something to do with it or whatever. But anyway, long story endless, I know, too late, right? Uh, the bear is is a is a is about a restaurant and without giving anything away at all, they they set all this up like right before they start the first episode or right as the episode starting. This is uh, the, his name is Carmi, a character in the show. He's the main character. His brother committed suicide and left him the restaurant. The restaurant, pardon my French, is a bit of a shithole, and he's trying to save it. Now, he was a Michelin star. That's a fiction, of course, but he was a Michelin star chef, and he's left his Michelin star, wor star world, sounds like Star Wars, to come down and run this little crappy restaurant to try to save it for himself, his family, and for his brother, his deceased brother, and so on and so forth. So the character that plays Sydney, she's like the young 
aspiring chef and she really wants a uh, Michelin star. And he's like, be careful what you wish for because it's really, really tough. And he said something that, that really struck a chord with me. Of course, everything comes back to trading with me, right? And she's like, well, what do I have to do? And he said, you have to care about and anything like it's everything. You have to care about anything like it's everything. And I think that is a really good million little things. I just kind of landed in my lap last night. So number 254,223, care about anything like it's everything. Trading is a shit ton of little details and little things that you must do to be successful. It's pretty easy on paper, okay? But you'll soon find out if you're new to trading, the map is not the territory. And you know what? Over time, you're gonna find out that the map is not the territory and there's 50,000 little things that can muck up your trade. Now, not to beat up this poor gentleman from earlier, but he's gonna do that once. He's one and done, so it's not like I'm making fun of him anymore, right? He'll never do that again. But ask yourself, do you have the right symbol, okay? Write it down. Tell your wife the symbol and tell her to remind you tomorrow or whatever, you know, do something like that. If you're brave enough, right? Did I place all my orders or at least some alerts where I need to take action, okay? Do I have orders or at least alerts at these action levels? And what about the 999,000, excuse me, 99,997 other things <laughs> that we're, we've talked about a few of those so far, but you really have to care about anything like it's everything. So if you want to be a successful trader, care about everything. Blah, blah, blah. Let me try that again. <laughs> Here's a sound bite. If you want to be a successful trader, care about anything like it's everything. I got it out. All right, let's shift gears. Let's jump into crypto. Any questions, anything so far? We'll hop over to crypto real quick. And here's the thing with crypto. We've been in a crypto bear market for quite some time. And it's a bit of a bummer. And one of the things, and, and this is the, again, you know, from a selfish from a selfish perspective, a lot of the educational stuff I do is to help me out, but through helping me, it helps you. I know it's kind of a uh, quid pro quo. What am I looking for? But uh, self-fulfilling, there's gotta be a way of putting this. But anyway, and one of the things that I came up with in a million little things is I missed a really big crypto trade not that long ago. And the reason I missed it was yeah, crypto market just looked like crap and I figured why bother? Well, notice that you have a lot of downside Landry like everybody and their brother was all excited about the having or having, however you want to call it, or ever it's I don't know the correct pronunciation. Because last time it was a was a really big deal. And this time the market's more of a meh. In fact, it's actually headed lower. And now I forget how many days, I think it's about 16 days of downside Landry light. So after you have some a set number of days, let's say 10 or so days of upside Landry light, you might have a trend developing. So look back here, you had Landry light, lows greater than the moving average, and, and then it began to take off. And I'll post, uh, I'll put some, I've been putting these charts on Twitter, the, the ones with the actual Landry light indicated down below. I think somebody has created it for trading view. And um, I'll try to think if I, if I know who or where that is, but somebody did create the Landry Life for Trading View just for what it's worth. Anyway, uh, Bitcoin not doing so hot in here. Ethereum looks okay. I mean, well, compared to Bitcoin, let's let's take a look at this. Let me just show you what I'm talking about. Ethereum compared to Bitcoin, ETC, BTC, is looking a lot better than Bitcoin in and of itself. So if I had to buy one, I would not buy either at this juncture, but if I had to buy one, I would choose Ethereum over Bitcoin. I have one little lonely position. It's not doing so hot in here. 
uh, it was really flying off its lows, kind of a kind of a sauce and handle, saucer and handle down here. And that's why I took that. But you can see I'm underwater on that. That's the only position I have on in crypto at the moment. But as I just said, I need to keep doing my homework. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but when crypto is in a rip roaring trend, sometimes you can just come in here and buy the strongest ones. Right now, it's not one of those times. The other thing to notice, even on these super strong or a lot of these super strong pairs one of my rules as a general statement is never buy a market below the 30 ema and as you go through these look at this okay this thing lost what 30 40 percent of its value below its ema so never buy a market as a general statement every now and then there might be an exception but it's, it's the exception rather than the norm but you can see, look at this stock or this crypto, right? Up around 50 cents or whatever, 25. It's lost half of its value all below the 30 EMA. Look at this, it's going straight down. So the point I'm trying to make is, even though these are popping tonight, for the most part, most of them or most all of them should be ignored because they're way below the 50, I'm sorry, the 30 EMA. And just for S&Gs, let's just check the downside. Okay, we're going to shift gears and go to stocks real quick. But you can see a lot of these are getting whacked. And, and again, just pay attention to that 30 EMA. And that's going to be your best friend. It really is. I just can't emphasize that enough. Look, we're up here at 120 or something. And now we're down here in the, in the 30s. And it just gets uglier from there if you go through all of these and see so I do need to pay attention. Uh, one thing I'm not, I haven't done lately. I haven't added new pairs in, so I need to do that. There's a lot I have to do. <laughs> There's only so much time in the day, though. Uh, but but I definitely need to make sure I'm paying attention to that and, and staying up on anything trading wise that needs to be done. All right, let me shift gears. Let me hop over to stocks. And if you guys want to talk about some individual stocks, let me know. Let me get this. Let me shift some stuff around real quick and check in my YouTube people. Just Alex from Brazil. Okay, that's the only comments we have. All right, let's hop into stocks. Okay, let's take a look at the P's real quick and uh, let me know if you guys wanna look at any symbols. We're gonna try to wrap it up as quickly as possible. I know everybody wants to go home and make the popcorn and all. We're having grilled cheese sandwiches with homemade soup tonight. Looking forward to that. All right, S&P 500 up a smidge today, better than Pocono, I suppose. It is trying to rally out of a pullback. One thing I've noticed is it's been super choppy on an intraday basis, and usually that's not a good thing when it's when it's choppy, chops around an intraday basis. But we're just shy of all-time highs, okay? So as a trend guy, I'm not going to argue with that. So far, so good, and we are rallying out of bullplex. So peas look pretty darn good. NASDAQ Composite even better okay it's beginning to rally nicely out of the bull flag and it's just a smidge a nets eyelash i gotta watch my language <laughs> below all-time high so so far so good there rusty 2000 i'm sick of talking about this stupid etf wide loose and all over the place still a head and shoulders top for now but it's so wide and loose i would not trade it one way or the other and maybe someday it will begin to take off, but now is not that day. EFA shares looks like they've topped out. We got a first thrust in the EFA shares, so that's not looking too good. That's the foreign shares. If we take a look, let's take a look at gold of commodity. Okay, so gold of commodity. Here's the thing about the Landry 100. Again, let's take a look at KJ. Okay, so this one went in tonight. It's a gold stock, but gold of commodity is going kind of sideways. And uh, in future episodes, we'll spend more and more time uh, taking a look at some of the stocks in the, in the Landry 100. Okay, so it was Jeff that did it. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Jeff said, I posted Landry Light Code for Thinkorswim in the Facebook group last fall. Yeah, I appreciate that. So I, I knew we had it in the Facebook group or somewhere. So if you're in the Facebook group, you already have it. If you're not, then, uh, then become a member <laughs> of the Facebook group. Telecom, look at that. New highs with a little bit of vigor. That's looking pretty darn good. Financials stuck in a range. It's kind of like you could you could kind of do the the yin with the yang game all uh, quite a bit. Let's take a look at internet. Internet's doing pretty good in here. Depends on what sector uh, 
indice you're looking at, but internet based on the media general general group is breaking out the new highs. Yeah, Jeff, thank you for that. If I haven't thank you, uh, I know I thank you initially, but if I hadn't thank you tonight. Let's take a look at silver. Silver looks okay. It looks a little bit better than gold. It's kind of a bigger picture type of pullback, so that looks okay. And getting back to the look at a different sectors. Take a look at like the home builders. They've topped out and they're looking kind of ugly. Uh, we were shorting, we shorted some a while back, or one in particular, and we failed miserably. So it's one of those right but early. And that's a short side. It's a pain in the butt. But it's down toward the bottom of its range. So that's looking kind of ugly. So again, you can kind of flip back and forth between the good, the bad, and a little bit of ugly out there. But overall, things are still okay. Q's doing good, by the way, just shy of all-time highs. I had a signal at 319, somewhere back here in the TFM 10% system. We'll, I'll dust that off in upcoming weeks, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But the Qs are doing pretty good. Let's take a look at the semiconductors. Now, what's interesting to semis is, as I think I alluded to a minute ago, some of the individual issues are getting whacked, but so far the semis look pretty darn good. And, and I know there's been I know some people are like dying to short the semis because they're high. Well, that's a bad idea for now, okay? I wouldn't rush out and do that just yet. But like, take a look at that. I think it was Micron I was looking at it earlier. Like I got whacked fairly hard, 7%, okay? And now it's back into this little base that it broke out from. I wonder if that's in the Landry 100. That'll probably have to come out soon. So uh, QCOM, I don't know if QCOM is, uh, is QCOM a, a semi? QCOM, no, that's, yeah, that's semiconductors, okay? QCOM came out of the Landry 100. You can see it was down uh, it was down 5%, okay? So it was doing pretty good when I put it in, and then it began to implode a little bit, so it came out. It is what it is. And this still looks okay as a possible pullback, but there are some semis that are out there failing a bit. But overall, the semiconductors still look pretty good. Major drugs just had new highs, and they came back in. So we could, we could play this game quite a bit. I know everybody's looking to go home. But the bottom line is the market is really, really mixed. Now, one thing I've been doing lately is, okay, glass half full, glass half empty. There's a lot of people out there that, and I don't want to pick on anybody in particular, but when they start seeing the internals deteriorate a little bit, they became they become like super bearish. Well, keep in mind that sometimes these things take time and sometimes they could be fixed really quickly. You get a, a, a decent rally in the overall market, and then you start getting a little sector rotation. All of a sudden, these weaker sectors begin to pick up. So for now, I'm going to see it as glass half full. If I start seeing a plethora of short setting up, and on top of that, can't find a long to save my life. Right now, I can't find a long to save my life. And that's, and that, that's not the database. That's because a lot of stocks are still at or near new highs and they haven't pulled back just yet, and there's some other things going on, but I'm not bearish just yet, and I refuse to be bearish as long as the market's making new highs. Now, getting back to 2007, the market did start going sideways. It was close to new highs, but it was going sideways for a while, and I apologize. As I, I know I've said this a thousand times, but I actually apologize to my clients because I couldn't find a long to save my life, and we started I started showing shorts in October 2007. You can go in and look at the archives. And they started working. And, you know, shorts are tough, as you probably know. But it was a very interesting thing. And that's from looking at all those stocks. Like I said earlier, looking at a, up to 2,000 stocks every day it gives me a really good feel for what's going on. And for me, it's kind of fun. I, I enjoy doing it. All right. Any questions, any individual issues you guys want to take a look at? Any favorite stock picks? A quiet bunch tonight going once going twice well, it looks like we'd hit one hour on the nose that's awesome well obviously you want to thank all you guys and girls for tuning tonight i appreciate your time out of your busy schedule anything unanswered you can shoot me an email david dave landry.com everybody have a great night to all my facebook peeps i'll see you tomorrow everybody else have a great weekend and for everyone may the trend be with you thank you so much you're welcome.